morning, everybody. I would like to say a word of welcome to our guests this morning. We're really glad you're here. We hope you feel very comfortable and relaxed with us. We are um, we're the perfect church for imperfect people. We are a place of grace, and uh, we're just walking the road of God's mercy and growth together. So let's take a moment and pray as we begin our service this morning. Father in heaven, you have called us together in your mercy. And uh, your mercy and your word has uh, come in two parts, truth and grace. You've spoken the truth to us when you told us that if we pretend we're not sinners, we're really only lying to ourselves. And we're not putting anything over on you. And so we thank you for that call and truth to come to you just as we are, that we don't have to put on our best anything, that we can just come to you just like we're coming home, just like kids coming home. And so, Father, give us confidence in you to come to you this morning as we are. And that confidence is going to come from your other promise, that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and renew us and cleanse us. And so, Father, we're banking on that promise that as we come to you in confession, openly acknowledging all the ways in which our lives miss the mark of perfection, of peace, of harmony, that you receive us as a loving Father and offer us complete forgiveness in Jesus. You offer us renewal and you offer us welcome and growth in the Holy Spirit that comes to live in us. And so, Father, we begin this service seeking from you whatever you would give us this morning as we gather in Jesus' name, where he promised that if two or three are gathered in his name, he's there in the midst of them. So we trust your presence, and we ask you to open up our hearts to receive whatever it is that you would give us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and begin. We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy, holy, holy. 
just in case you think I lacked it for it. So anyway, I want to welcome everybody here this morning. A couple of announcements as we uh, continue on this morning. Uh, we have right now, this week we have three Bible studies you can attend. There's one on Monday nights at 7 o'clock at uh, the Lovelace's house. And then on Wednesday there's two. There's one in the morning. I lead at 10 a.m. at uh, the Wycliffe building over on Moss Park Road. And then at 7 p.m. at Mayor Bread, I also lead a Bible study. The Sunday morning one's a little more chatty. It's two hours. And then the one at Mayor Bread in the evening at 7, we just get right to it at 7 to 8. So you can schedule that one hour and... And uh, those are good Bible studies to come to. We got some middle school youth nights coming up. If you're in middle school, December 4th and December 18th. Uh, next Sunday is the last Sunday for collecting the shoe boxes, uh, which are uh, Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes, which are shoe boxes that get filled with little toys and toiletries and stuff, and they get taken to very impoverished regions of the world and presented as gifts of love from us in Jesus' name. And if you want more information, it's also on the table back there with the Christmas lights on it. That's all the announcements I have. Does anyone else have any announcements? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we are on the third Sunday, so we're going to be packaging up uh, bags for the homeless right after church. And uh, so anybody wants to stay in the office, that'll be fine. And also, in the meantime, we'd like to do a really nice, big big bunch of them for Christmas, because I'm sure the people are going to be even out there in more greater numbers. So, if you want to help, that's fine, so if you would just at least let us know if you want to take a bag. Right. For those of you who don't know, those are bags we put together that you can keep in your car, so that if you're driving along and you see someone in need on the side of the road, instead of averting your eyes, you can actually call them over your car and say, I have something for you. You can hand them a bag filled with stuff they need, food, toiletries, and then also a bag, which is also nice to have. So it's surprising where you see those people. I don't know if you guys, um, you know, it's, it's like once you start looking, they end up in really unusual parts where you would not expect homeless people to be. So if you're not, if you're somebody that thinks, oh, I don't see any homeless people where I am, take a bag and you might be surprised that you're able to give it away. So just something to think about. There's three here, right along right, the road, right here in our neighborhood. Perfectly yeah. middle and upper middle class area. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> Sometimes summer gets a little long, and you get you, you start to like you're ready to go back to school because you're kind of summer starting to get a little long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, friends, right? That's a big deal. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Enduring the bad stuff. Going to school is a privilege. It's a, it's a, education is a great thing, and friends are a great thing. And school has both of them, so that's awesome. So we're at the end of Acts, and one of the things that I think it's good to do, whenever you're kind of at an ending of something, and people do this at the end of the year all the time, too, is you kind of look back over the year. And uh, some people look back over the year, and they make New Year's resolutions. Have they, any of you ever made a New Year's resolution? Like you're going to do something different? Sometimes people do that at the end of school. They look back on the school year and say, you know what? I think that I'd want to be 
kinder next year, or I want to work a little harder on my homework next year, or next year I'd like to be able to run a little faster or whatever. So today we're actually looking through the entire book of Acts, and we're going to try and find some lessons in it. I'm curious if you have anything you remember. We've been going through Acts since, I don't know, the beginning of the summer. Do you remember anything that kind of was important for you? Yeah. Yeah, that's a big deal, huh? That, that God can take people who are really on the wrong path, and as, as long as they're like, Saul, the, one of the important things was that Saul was trying to do the right thing, but he was doing the wrong thing. But the fact that he was trying to do the right thing meant God could get a hold of him and steer him. How many of you like to ride bikes? Have you ever, been, have you ever tried steering a bike when you're not, when you're standing still? What happens on a bike if you're standing still? You fall, don't you? What happens on a bike if you're pedaling and you're going the wrong way? What do you do? Well, no, if you once you're pedaling. You turn it around, right? You just turn it around. And so that's one of the things, and I think that, that Paul is a great example of that. As long as we're moving through our lives and we're trying to do what God wants us to do, I think we need to worry more about just being the kind of people who God wants us to be rather than getting every single thing right because as long as we're trying to be the person God wants to be, God can steer us. Just like a bike. You can't steer a bike that's not pedaling. But if you pedal, then you can steer the bike whatever direction you want to go. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I meant you, I meant you are pedaling and you're, dri- you're riding the bike, but you're riding in the wrong direction. As opposed to standing still. If you're st- the point here that I'm trying to make is that, <laughs> is that if you're standing still, you can't go anywhere. If you're pedaling and you're riding your bike in the wrong direction, then you can turn around. And our life with God is like that. If we're just sitting there doing nothing, it's very hard for God to direct us. But if we're doing something, trying to be the person God wants us to be, even if we're doing the wrong thing, then God can steer us like a bike that's actually moving. So how's that? All right. Wait, leave. <laughs> now that, that, that's the lesson. So you guys, uh, Sandy's going to have a little revelation lesson. <laughs> I'm thankful for little children's questions so that we can understand what the pastor saw. (laughs) If only you were the first person to ever say that. (laughs) Well, uh, I'm looking forward to what Pastor John has to say about Acts today because uh, it's a story, it's a history kind of thing. And uh, sometimes I think it's hard to see God's grace and what he's trying to say in Acts all together. So hopefully Pastor John's going to pull that out for us today. But in the meantime, I do want to remind you about the uh, green card that's in your bulletin. Please go ahead and click to one side and let us know that you're here today. And on the other side, go ahead and if you have any prayer requests or praise reports, go ahead and complete those. Making sure that you check these two small boxes at the very bottom to let us know whether we pray aloud during the service this morning. And then uh, add this to the Journey of Life email or newsletter. Also, we will be collecting an offering this morning for those of us who worship here regularly. This is our opportunity to spread truth and grace throughout the Lake Noma area as well as throughout the world. So we ask that you consider uh, uh, putting your contribution in as God uh, lays on your heart to do so. If you're a visitor, however, there's no obligation. We're just glad that you're worshiping with us this morning. Let me go ahead and pray for us. Heavenly Fathers, we um, prepare to... Hear your word this morning. We ask that you help us set aside any extraneous thoughts and focus on what Pastor John has to say. Amen. So we, uh, we've gone through Acts, and I want to just begin with the reading this morning. It's the tail end of Acts. It's the very last few verses. And it's Acts chapter 28, verses 11 through 31. It goes like this. After three months... We set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, the ship of Alexandria with the twin gods as a figurehead. Putting it at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days, and from there we made a circuit and arrived at Redium, 
And after one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we came to Petula. Thereafter, there we found brothers who invited us to stay with them for seven days, and so then we finally came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they had heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and the Three Taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came to Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. After three days, Paul called together the local leaders of the Jews. And when they had gathered, he spoke to them, saying, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or against the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they examined me, they wished me, they wished to set me at liberty, because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against myself or my nation. For this reason, therefore, I asked to see you and to speak with you, since it's because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing these chains. And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken anything bad about you. But we do want to hear what your views are, for with regard to this, this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. So they set an appointment, a day and an hour, for them to come and hear Paul. They came to him at his lodging in great numbers. From morning till evening, Paul expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Some were convinced by what he said, but others did not believe. In disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one last statement. Paul had told them, The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to these people and say, You will indeed hear, but you will never understand. You will indeed see, but you will never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. And with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. Paul lived there for two years at his own expense, and welcomed everybody who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God, and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. That's the end of the book of Acts. You know what the first thing I thought of when I, I heard that was? The Truman Show. Anyone ever see The Truman Show? It's a Jim Carrey movie. Well, the way The Truman Show works is this. Uh, this director adopted a child. And he made a TV show out of this child. We raised him on the set. And it was just a live TV show of this kid, Truman, who grew up. And he grew up in a van and everything. But then he finally starts to figure out something's not quite right where he lives. Because he's never been told he's being raised on a movie set. And everybody is glued to their sets as Truman starts to figure out that, that this is something's not real here. Everybody is glued to their set, and they're watching 24-7. And then finally he figures out how to get out of the movie set. And when he gets out, everybody goes, well, click. And just goes back to whatever they were doing. It was so important, and then all of a sudden, it's done. It's gone. And I kind of feel that way about Acts. I feel like it didn't really end. It's like, well, Paul stayed there and preached. That's the end of it. Now, uh, there's tradition about how Paul was, uh, was uh, martyred, but, but that's not in the scriptures, and Luke doesn't seem to feel the need to tell us that. And I'm, I'm thinking, why does, why does Luke do that? Why does he just leave it hanging? And I was thinking of beginnings and endings, and I thought maybe there's even a lesson for this in this idea of not resolving things for us. Because Luke does not resolve this for us. He says some believed and some didn't. And then Paul stayed there and preached, and that's that. Now, Jesus did the same thing. So I thought I would, would think about those for a couple of minutes. Some, some other stories from the Bible that leave us hanging. We're like, well, what's next? And you don't know. Some, some things wrap up real nicely. The parable of the sower, Jesus explains it, and it's a nice package. You know, it's just like 
here it is, and there's nothing, you just sort of can think about it. But some things in the Bible, they don't actually resolve. You're left to sort of like wonder, which seems a lot like life sometimes, where it doesn't resolve and you're left to like wonder. One is the story of Jonah, which many of you are familiar with, I'm sure. Jonah was a prophet, and God told him to go to Nineveh. And Nineveh happened to be east, and Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, so he got on a boat and went west. And that's when the, uh, the storm came up, and the, he told the sailors the storm was his fault. God was getting him to throw him overboard, and everything would be fine. So they did that after a bunch of stuff. And uh, a big fish came and swallowed Jonah. That's the part we all know, Jonah and the great fish, right? And the fish swam back to the shore where Jonah had tried to get away from him and spit him out on the shore. And God told Jonah again, listen, Jonah, you got to go to Nineveh. <laughs> and this time Jonah went. Would you believe it? <laughs> so, uh, and that's, that's usually where the story ends. That's where, that's where we stop. And what actually happens is Jonah goes to Nineveh, and for three days he walks up and down the city preaching and proclaiming that if they don't repent, the city's going to be destroyed. And the Ninevites were, were nasty people. They, had, they were part of the Assyrians, and they, they had really been uh, mean. They were, they were armies who did horrible things, and, and, and probably Jonah had actually seen cities that had been raised by this Assyrian army. And so his, his thinking is, is a little understandable, because what he really doesn't want is he doesn't want God to have mercy on the Assyrians. So he, he preaches in Nineveh, and, and then he goes up on a hill, and he sits and waits to see God smack the city. And destroy it. And what happens is the Ninevites all repent. They are in sackcloth and ashes and crying out for mercy. And so Jonah is sitting up there on the hill and he gets mad. He gets mad at God for not smiting the Ninevites. And so God teaches him a little lesson. He has a God causes a plant to grow up and give him shade. And, and, and Jonah likes the shade and he's happy with the plant because it's providing him shade and there's a little breeze. And then, and then the plant suddenly dies. And then Jonah's really mad about the plant. He cared about the plant. That was his plant, man. It was sunny, and then this plant had shade. And, um, and where's my plant? And then God closes the little dialogue with Jonah about the plant. And he says this. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who don't know their left hand from their right? And also many cattle. And that's where the book ends. We don't know what happened to Jonah. We don't know whether Jonah said, you know what, you're right. Uh, God, your, your mercy, you have taught me the lesson. Or whether Jonah said, you know, who knows? We don't know. And we're left to sort of chew on it. We're left to chew on the story of Jonah and say, what is this doing to me? How is God doing things to me through Jonah? There's another story uh, that, that kind of like doesn't ever resolve. And it's another very familiar one. It's the prodigal son. You, most of you will remember. The, the story goes like this. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger son came to his dad and said, Father, I would like my inheritance right now. And his dad, in what can only be described as um, madness, says, okay. Because I don't know what father among you would say, okay, and just get your checkbook out and say, yeah, yeah, go ahead. But anyway, the father did that. And the son goes off and squanders it in loose living. And then there's a famine, and he doesn't have any real friends because all the people he hung with were just hanging around with him because he had all this money and he was blowing on everybody. And then the famine is so bad that he's a Jewish young man feeding pigs for somebody in some foreign country. And it's, he's so hungry... He wishes he could eat the pig food. And he comes to his senses, and he says, listen, I, I, I've blown the whole sun thing, but my dad would probably hire me. And at least his hired servants have enough food to eat. So he rehearses his little remorse speech. Uh, I'm going to go to my dad and say, Dad, I've sinned against God, against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just, would you please hire me as one of your servants? So he rehearses his speech, and he goes back, but then dad sees him a long way off. And he goes running up to him, and his, his, he starts this little speech, Father, I've sinned against God and against you. And he, the dad says, shut up, give me a hug. And then he goes and gets clothes and shoes and the family signet ring to put back on his finger. And he kills the fatted calf to have a huge party. And so far, so good. But there's another son. 
and he's out in the field, and he hears something, so he sends one of the servants to find out what's going on. And the servant comes back and says, your brother came home and your dad's having a party. And the older son says, what? And the dad, again, uncharacteristically, actually comes out from the party to beg the older son to come into the party. And he says, son, everything I have now belongs to you. Because he did, in fact, blow all his inheritance. And, but we need to rejoice today because the, your, your brother was dead and he's alive. He was lost and is found. And the son says, listen, dad, I have slaved away for all these years. And this son of yours comes home. Notice it's not my brother, it's this son of yours. How many of you married people have ever done that if you have kids, right? Your daughter's crying. You've been there, right? So uh, that, that's the way he's talking. And then, that's, and then the dad begs him, and, sa- and this is what he, he says. His dad, this is the last verse of the parable. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive, and he was lost and is found. And again, that's it. We don't know what happens. Did the older brother go in? Did the younger brother come out to try to get the older brother to come in? Did the older brother stomp off to go have a party with his friends? Did the, how long did the dad stay out? We just don't know. It's just like, well, it's uh, your job to write the ending of this parable. It's your job to write your place in this parable. It's your job to find your life in this parable. And I think Acts might be the same way. I think Acts might be the same way. So I'm going to pass something out. And we are going to go under the assumption that Luke left this the end of Acts like that because he didn't really want us to pass those around that way. Take one and pass it on. You guys have been doing that a long time. Actually, you probably haven't done that for 15 years. Yeah. Uh, we're not that old. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. 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 And this is... I'm looking around the room, and we got quite a few visitors today, and we're so thrilled you're here. But what you need to know is you happen to come to church on the last Sunday in a sermon series that essentially started in July. And so we've covered a lot. We've covered the entire book of Acts. And what I would like to do for the remainder of our time together is give each of us a chance to reflect on Acts and kind of uh, um, think through it. We're going to uh, review, reflect, and revise. We're going to look back over Acts and kind of just really hit everything real fast. It's going to be cliff notes on Acts. Then I'm going to give you a chance to reflect. And reflect, actually, the root words of reflect mean to bend back. And so what we're going to do is take that story of Acts, and I'm going to give you a chance to bend the story of Acts back on yourself and say, where does this touch me? What part of my soul does this speak to? Today, where where is where might the Holy Spirit be leading me through the stories and the accounts that we have read? And then we're gonna I'm gonna give you a chance to review your life, your plans, and everything like that, and see if there's anything that you would like to uh, think differently about based on what we have read in Acts. So uh, it, we're gonna it's we're probably gonna take I don't know. It's not going to take too long, so I'm going to move quickly, but we'll see how long it takes. Um, so, this is Acts, beginning at the top where it says Acts. The first thing we saw was Jesus ascended into heaven, and he, he hands it on, right? He's gone. This is, a, this is some sort of ceremony where Jesus says, my work is now really in your hands. Now, the Holy Spirit will be with you, but listen, I'm gone. I mean, he's with us in spirit and everything, but physically he's not going to be appearing to them again. And so that's a big kind of a handoff moment. And then the disciples, uh, they decide they need to choose somebody to replace Judas who died. And then there's the story of Pentecost. Jesus had told them to wait. Waiting is a big, can be a big part of our faith life. And so Jesus told them to wait, not to go out and try and do anything until the power of the Holy Spirit came on them. And then on Pentecost, you remember, they were all huddled in a room, and the Holy Spirit came on them. There's a sound of a rushing wind, and tongues, kind of like tongues of fire, divided and landed on all of them. And they all spoke, and Peter jumped up and preached. 
and 5,000 people came to faith in Jesus that day. It was a big day, and maybe there's a lesson for you in that day. Uh, and then after that, we have some healings. Uh, Peter heals the beggar, and then Peter and John are hauled into the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling body, and they're questioned. And uh, they simply, you know, tell uh, what they've done, and they tell about Jesus, and the Sanhedrin says, well, don't do it again, and sends him out. And, of course, they don't listen to the Jewish ruling body. Then we have the story of uh, Ananias and Sapphira, which uh, is where somebody had brought a, a great offering to the church, and, and people were occasionally selling property or whatever just to support the needs of the church because it was a very impoverished time. And so somebody else had sold a piece of property and brought the money just to take care of the poor people in the church. And then Ananias and Sapphira sold a piece of property, but they colluded and they said, we'll say this is all the money so we get the, you know, the, the glory that goes with this kind of gift. But they kept some of it back. And the Holy Spirit let uh, Peter know what had happened. And actually, in this particular instance, Ananias and Sapphira both lost their lives because they lied to the Holy Spirit. So that might be a lesson in there for you. Uh, uh, Gamaliel, the, the Sanhedrin, the ruling body, uh, is trying to figure out what to do with these people. And Gamaliel makes a very wise speech. He said there's really only two possibilities, and there might be a lesson in here for you. One is that, uh, that they're just doing this on their own. And we killed the leader, so this whole thing's going to dissipate. The Jesus movement will dissipate because Jesus is dead. Or, this is really a movement of God, and all you're doing is going to find yourself fighting against God. So, you should make your decision. So that seems like a wise way to look at life. The next thing, the choosing of the seven, is when uh, the apostles were kind of really wrapped up in, in the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, operation of this church the body of people, specifically making sure all the, the widows uh, got their daily food distribution and stuff, but it was taken away from their time for teaching and prayer, and so they decided to choose seven other people to do that uh, so they could dedicate their full time to teaching and prayer. And then the next three where it says Stephen, you'll remember Stephen is the first martyr, and, uh, and when Stephen was martyred, all the uh, clothes, the, the outer robes that people took off when they were getting ready to throw the stones to kill somebody, they would lay the foot of the robes by somebody, and that was kind of like the approving official of this execution. And that guy's name was Saul, who we will meet again in a minute. Um, we have, uh, we have uh, some other uh, conversions going on. Uh, people come to the Lord. We have Philip uh, meeting the Ethiopian eunuch. Kind of Philip just gets directed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, Go to this desert, go out to this place in the middle of the desert, and, and Philip has the kind of heart that can hear direction from the Holy Spirit, crazy direction. It's like if somebody told you, if you just felt in your, if this is like if you felt in your mind uh, uh, the Holy Spirit really pressing upon you just to go, I don't know, where's like a really deserted place in Florida? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, anyway, you get the idea. There's nothing there to go to. It's just like there's nothing there, and the Holy Spirit tells Philip to go, but he's like tuned in enough that he's willing to do this. And he goes there, and it turns out there's an a, a Ethiopian official with his caravan traveling back from visiting Jerusalem, and he's reading the scriptures, and uh, uh, Philip gets a chance to explain it to him, and so that guy is baptized, so that's cool. Uh, so that, that might be a lesson. And then we have Saul's conversion, which I talked to the kids about, where Paul was, boy, he was passionate for God, but he was passionately riding in the wrong direction. And uh, God uh, appeared to him, Jesus appeared to him, and, uh, and said, uh, I, why are you persecuting me? And Paul said, who are you? And Jesus said, I'm Jesus who you are persecuting. And so uh, Saul's passion for God got redirected toward the Messiah, Jesus, uh, through God's intervention. Uh, Saul met with the believers who were a little scared. Maybe there's a lesson in there for you for that, because some of the believers were really kind of scared to have Paul come in and be there, because he had been persecuting and killing Christians. And um, so, uh, but, but uh, one guy, uh, Barnabas, uh, put his, kind of like figuratively put his arm around Paul and said, come on, I'll walk you in, it's okay. And, and Barnabas kind of vouched for Paul. So, uh, 
then we have uh, um, Peter does some things, some healings, uh, and then uh, Peter's put in prison and he escapes. And now we're down, uh, we're beginning Paul's first missionary trip. Paul and Barnabas started out, uh, they were on the island of Cyprus, and Paul talked to the official, and he was converted, but this other guy, the sorcerer, uh, uh, was rebuked by Paul. And then on the journey, Mark, who ended up writing one of the gospel accounts that we know in the Bible, deserted Paul on this trip, and that's going to come back later too. So then they're in Antioch, and there are people turning to Jesus, and then the, there are people who are angry about this whole thing, so they get thrown out of the city. And then they're in Iconium, and they're talking about Jesus, and some people believe, and some people don't, and then there's a murder plot against them, so they have to flee that city. And then they're in cities of Lystra and Derba, and right around there, because Paul was healing people, first they thought he was a god, and then... The people from uh, Iconium and Antioch came down and stirred up persecution, and then they stoned Paul and left him for dead. And then finally he went back to Antioch. So that's the first journey. And then they had the council at Jerusalem because they had a huge decision to make. And the decision was this. We have Gentile people who are following Jesus. Do they need to become Jews? That's basically it. And, and if they had to become Jews, the symbolic, the sort of overarching thing they talked about was being circumcised. So do Gentile believers have to be circumcised? And the council at Jerusalem said no. In fact, the only thing they could come up with is three rules, which I think should be reflective of the way we walk with our faith, too. They told them, uh, don't eat meat, sacrifice to idols, or blood, and uh, abstain, abstain from sexual immorality. That's the whole book of rules they handed the Gentile believers. So, then Paul went on his second missionary journey, and this time uh, he has to take Silas because Paul and Barnabas were partners. But Barnabas wanted to take Mark with him, and Paul said, listen, Mark deserted us last time, and we need reliable people. And Barnabas said, I think Mark will hang on this time. And Paul said, I don't. And Barnabas said, I do. And Paul said, I don't. And Barnabas said, I do. And Paul said, fine, I'll take Silas and you take Mark and we'll go our separate ways. And they did. But they parted friends. I kind of looked like them. But it does say they had a heated disagreement. Uh, and, and, but, but it turned out the gospel spread further because they were both still uh, committed to that. So then Paul and Silas are traveling, and that's where Timothy joins up with them, who turns out to be the pastor that Paul wrote the book of books of 1st and 2nd Timothy to. Uh, Paul got sick, quite sick, in Galatia. Uh, so don't think that just because you have faith, it means you're never going to get sick. Uh, then Paul also is trying to travel, and it turns out the Holy Spirit is guiding him to a different place than he plans to go to. So there might be a lesson in there if the Holy Spirit is uh, leading people to different places than they think they're supposed to go to, even if they're the right place to go. And then at the bottom of the first page, Philippi, uh, some miraculous things happen there. Uh, there's a, a jailer who's converted. There's an earthquake, and, and uh, but they don't leave. And then Paul starts invoking his Roman citizenship. But he doesn't invoke it until after he's thrown in jail, and he sort of makes the officials come and formally escort him out of jail instead of sneaking away quietly. So he's not afraid to sort of, you know, make a public showing or whatever. So in Thessalonica, they started preaching and had some, uh, some people believe in Jesus, and then there's a mob that came up to try to stop them. They couldn't find Paul, so they took one of his friends and grabbed him and beat him. And then they went to Berea, and that's where we find that the, it says the Bereans were more noble than the other people because they met with Paul every day and they searched the scriptures to see if what Paul said was really true. And there's a lesson in there for us, too, about searching the scriptures to see if what I say is true. Please do that. Please. Uh, and then the agitators from Thessalonica came down and stirred up trouble in Berea, so they had to flee again. And then in Athens, Paul went to this place called the Areopagus, which is where all the philosophers met to philosophize, and he tried to speak to them there about God. Uh, and it, it, you know, to, to small effect, really. 
Uh, then in Corinth, he was persecuted. Uh, they, they dragged, the, the Jewish people were persecuting him and dragged him to the Roman in charge. And the Romans said, this is like your little religious stuff. Get out of my court. Basically, that's what he said. Get this out of my court. Which, you know, you hear that in America, too. This doesn't belong in the court. Uh, then he continues on traveling, traveling. In Ephesus, um, we find Paul preaching. First of all, he casts out a demon from uh, a, a, a slave girl who could tell the future. And her owner gets really mad because now his way, means of making a living is gone because uh, the power of Jesus took away the demon that by which he was making his living. And then these other people who were making a fine living also got mad at Paul. Demetrius the silversmith led a riot because Paul was turning people away from the Greek gods. And so they weren't going to be able to sell any more shrines or idols. Their, their living would go down. And so they led a riot. And, but the riot was not about their living. When they were whipping the people up, they didn't say, let's drive them out of here so we can make more money. They whipped them up and said, let's drive them out of here because our God is great. So they tried to use culture, even though their real motive was their own game. So there might be a lesson in there somewhere. Let's see, and then Paul's in Macedonia. In Greece, and you remember in, in Macedonia, uh, Eutychus was the, the young man in the window. Paul was preaching for hours and hours, and he falls down uh, from the second story, and he's dead. And Paul raises him to life again. They bring him back up to the room, and then Paul continues to teach until morning. So uh, even, even, a guy, <laughs> even a guy falling out of the <laughs> window and dying doesn't stop a sermon when a sermon's got to go on. I am not taking that as my lesson. <laughs> Just so you know. All right. Uh, then he goes on uh, in, in Caesarea. Now, as Paul's, these last few cities, Paul is making his way back to Jerusalem. And at several different points, people come to tell, God, tell Paul, you should not go to Jerusalem, you should not go to Jerusalem. And where does Paul go? Jerusalem. Right. In Jerusalem, Paul doesn't cause any trouble at all. In fact, he goes out of his way to not cause trouble. He takes a vow and he shaves his head and he's doing the sacrifices and he's not bringing Gentiles into the temple. But by this time, the Jewish leaders are so uh, upset with him and with the whole Jesus thing, they're trying to get him anyways and they make up charges and they have him arrested. Uh, and they're going to try and get him killed. Uh, but... Paul's friends hear about it, and they tell the Roman guard in charge. And so the Roman guard in charge has Paul transferred to a different city, uh, Caesarea, where the Romans are fully in charge, as opposed to Jerusalem. that kind of has the temple police and all that stuff. So that keeps Paul safe. Paul gets to appear for, for several people, and finally the Jews get, uh, the Jews have try to manipulate the situation so Paul can get transferred back to Jerusalem where they can murder him somehow or another. And so that's where Paul appeals to Caesar because that's his only option. And that's where we were two or three weeks ago and he sails to Rome and they get shipwrecked and then they arrive in Rome and here we are. And Paul was in Rome for two years and that's the last one. So this is what we're going to do with the remainder of our time, which is not too much. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to give you a little time right now. Uh, we've reviewed kind of a lot of stuff. I know, I know that's a lot of stuff, especially for you who visitors today uh, um, and, and people who haven't been in town during the whole series. That was a lot to go through, but maybe you got something, or maybe one of the parables. But the idea is that God doesn't just want us to know the stories. He wants us to reflect on them, to bend them back onto ourselves. And when we bend them back onto ourselves, we ask the Holy Spirit to show us what God wants us to see and learn and change because of what the Word has put into our heart and our spirit today. So there's a little space on the bottom, and uh, for some of you this will be plenty, and some of you maybe there's something that really hits your heart and you want to go home and write more about it later if you're writing type. So we've, we've reviewed, and now what I want to give you time to do is to reflect, to bend this back on yourself. What strikes you? What, what, what kind of stands out for you from all this stuff we've just read? What is the Holy Spirit maybe bringing to your mind right now? Is there something that, 
that stands out to you. Write it right. If something stands out to you, write it right now. Don't stop. Don't wait. Just do it right now. I'm going to give you. So, nobody even wears a watch anymore, and everybody does this to symbolize that we're going to like take time. Anyways. Old guys need light, but you can't tell them the time. Okay. Right? <laughs> yeah. And you know what? I thought of that. Remember that the lights that were on in the beginning of the service? Uh, those are security lights, and we can't turn them off without a key. And so I decided to let that go because I thought, we need the light today. And then somebody came and made it like it's supposed to be, actually, normally off. So um, let's see. Hey, Doug, you just, would you run back and turn the switch on, on, on in the back corner there? Sure. And I also have writing instruments if anybody needs Okay. I'm gonna, let's take a moment and pray while Doug goes and turns the lights on. Father in heaven, we have, uh, we've seen uh, the whole sweep of Acts, which starts with your son ascending into heaven 40 days after his resurrection. And then uh, Pentecost and Holy Spirit just being poured out on those disciples. But we also see that that, it, that it certainly uh, didn't put them on easy street and, and peaceful street in their lives. We've seen times when you have miraculously intervened. We've seen Paul stoned and left for dead. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, things that have happened in this long, uh, many-year history that Luke left us here in the book of Acts. And I know that you have things that apply to our lives. So I ask you for each of us just to pique our interest in something or, or show us something or just lift something kind of up in front of us so we can... Uh, so that we can just kind of see something that your Holy Spirit, which is here now, and it's your wind, it's blowing through all of us right now. And so I ask you to just sort of open our minds up to uh, each of us individually, kind of something, let it bubble up, let it surface, let, it, let a light kind of shine on a little piece of the story that, that is the peace that you would have us, each of us individually, see this morning. And so we ask you to do that in Jesus' name. So uh, just take like 30 seconds and, and think about what might be bubbling up for you and, and write it down. Right? It's, it's helpful to write. When you write things down, you make them concrete. Uh, you obviously don't have to write them down. Let's check them out. All right, once, you, once you've written that down, the next thing is, and, and this is the last thing I want to do this morning, is to revise, to look again at the way you see your life and your relationships. So this thing that's bubbled up to the surface of, of your consciousness that the Holy Spirit's brought there, how does that change the way you look at the world or the way you look at yourself or your friendships or your goals or your coworkers or your enemies? How, how is God working in your life? Maybe... Maybe you see that God is working in acts through all these different things and, and you're feeling like things feel out of control to you and, and what's going on is God is trying to lift that weight from your shoulders to see that he's working. Or, or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe you feel like, you know, maybe you feel like God is supposed to control every little thing and if bad things happen, it must be my fault and I'm not doing something right. And then you've seen... You've seen bad and good things happen to everybody in Acts. You know, at one point, people are being raised from the dead. At another point, Paul is stoned and left for dead. And so maybe, uh, maybe you can release this idea that God is micromanaging everything and you can take more responsibility uh, for your part in God's kingdom. Maybe that's what it is. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's you and God here. And I'm going to give you three minutes. Oh, I'd like to just give you three minutes right now, and I'm going to play a little music because silence makes some people uncomfortable. So uh, I'm going to play a little music, and I'm going to give you three minutes just to uh, take, it, take a little time with God. Uh, Holy Spirit, we just ask you to blow through this room and show everybody what each person needs to hear from you. And 
and let our hearts be open to whatever it is that each of us may be here from you. In Jesus' name. And you could, if, if you have people you talk to about these kind of things, feel free to have quiet discussions. Take a moment to pray. Father in heaven, you certainly have sort of, uh, you have this universal revealed truth of your, your love for us in Jesus Christ and your power over death and the grave in his resurrection. And your call to, to uh, that we love each other and that would be the mark that we are your disciples. We have love for each other. We have these big universal commands, but we've also seen that you have individual direction for us. You have uh, you, you interact with us each in, in ways that uh, can speak to our spirits, that sometimes uh, bring comfort to areas of pain or loss in our hearts and our lives, and sometimes bring encouragement and, and even maybe a little pressure sometimes into those areas where we need to step out or step up or step forward. And so, Father, I ask you that you would give us ears to hear from you. And uh, let your Holy Spirit be our leader as a congregation and each as individuals. In Jesus' name. We'll continue as we collect the offerings and the prayer cards.
Father, you've shown us such a great variety of things uh, as we've come through Acts. But, uh, now we just we come to you with all the stuff of our hearts, the stuff that's going on, the stuff that weighs us down, or the praises for the things you've done in life. But we come to you as uh, you are a Father who desires us to be near you and wants to give us comfort and hope and peace and joy and power. Father, we want to pray for comfort for the families of the 134 students who were killed in Kenya yesterday. We want to pray for the people in Beirut, the people in Paris, uh, the people in Jerusalem. Father, there's just uh, violence, uh, just violence all over the world right now. It's, and so we pray, we come to you. We don't know what to do as we're standing here. But to come to you with our prayers and you told us to pray for peace. And so that is what we pray for. We pray for peace, just a, an absence of violence. But we also pray for peace in the hearts of all those people who are driven to such, uh, driven to those violent acts. We pray for the peace of your son, Jesus, to infect their hearts and minds and call them home to you. Father, we pray for Joanne uh, for recovery from her gallbladder surgery. Let that recovery be, be quick and complete and with minimum of pain. I want to pray for uh, uh, some people who... This is the anniversary of their losing loved ones. And uh, Father, that's... Uh, we just lift them up to you for the comfort that only you can give them that, that comes from Jesus who came out of the grave to show us that the grave does not hold our loved ones. We also ask that you would bring uh, your people into the lives of those who are grieving uh, to, to come alongside them and to grieve with them and to share their pain and just be together with them in those difficult times. Um, we want to especially offer you our thanksgiving for all the visitors you brought to us today. It's a privilege to have them here. And, um, thank you for that. We continue our prayers for Barbara and Ralph as they suffer from dementia. We pray for them and their families to have patience and peace. We continue our prayers uh, for health and healing uh, for Brad Tibbs and for Donna Olmstead. We also continue to pray for healing for Rick Campbell from his lymphoma. And we want to pray for Margie, who has terminal cancer, and they saw that her final road you know, to meet you, that you would give her and her loved ones peace. We pray for our servicemen and women who deployed, that you would keep them safe, not only in their body, but in their spirits, that even as they uh, engage in violence and uh, force as part of the call of their uh, duties, that you would uh, guard their hearts so that uh, their hearts would not be succumbed to the lures of hatred. We want to pray for everybody who's undergoing persecution around the world for their release. We pray for persecutors that you would change their hearts and we pray for our Christian brothers and sisters that your Holy Spirit would do a miracle in their heart and enable them to give a testimony of love even to, to the people persecuting them. We pray for local ministries we support, for Here's Life Inner City, for the Prince of Peace Food Pantry, for Kairos Prison Ministries, for Central Florida Children's Home, for Samaritan's Purse and Operation Christmas Child as they uh, move into their collections week. Just let that be a joyful celebration of your love shared in the world in a very tangible way. We pray for our mission and ministry workers, for Tom and Marilyn, for Wayne and Grace, for Michael and Leanne, and for David and Ruth. We pray for people around the world who don't know the good news, that, that all is forgiven in Jesus, that you are holding nothing against us, that, that in the midst of this deeply mysterious life that we all live, that you have spoken your truth into that, the light of Jesus Christ, and, um, and that though all mysteries are not solved, in terms of our understanding, all our needs are met in Jesus, that we are created with purpose, 
that our lives are flooded with your love, and that we are, our spirits are safe in your hands, and in Jesus we can trust completely in you to take us home to be with you when each of us uh, faces that final uh, door of death. We also want to pray for our own congregation that you would enable us to be a place of grace and truth that reflects your command uh, that your people love one another, and that will be the mark of your true disciples. Grant that we can be that place, and also that we can be inviting new people in and, and warmly welcoming people in Jesus' name into this journey of, of grace and truth, a place where we embrace faith and hope and love and a sense of mission in our lives. Father, all these things we lift up to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior, our brother, our friend, and our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. couple of uh, logistical things as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together this morning. Uh, I'll be here with the bread and wine. We just kind of kind of come in just like a family. It all works out. And then you can either dip your bread, if you want, in the stoneware cup in the middle, or you can take a sip if you prefer to celebrate communion that way in one of the uh, metal cups toward the outside. We don't decide who takes communion here and who doesn't. We speak the words of Jesus uh, that makes this meal what it is, and then we invite you to receive the meal in the spirit and the way in which Jesus is offered it. On the night when our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and when he gave it thanks, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, after supper, he took the cup, and when he gave it thanks, he passed it to his disciples. It's the truth of this all of you. This cup is my blood and my covenant, which is shed for the forgiveness of sin. To do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father, we're here to celebrate this meal that Jesus himself started. A meal that he called his very body and blood for our forgiveness. Father, we remember his death. We remember that his, his willing to be crucified by choice, as horrible as that is, is a demonstration to us of just how much you love us that you would undergo anything if we would just come home like the prodigal son. Father, we come home again to you now. We come home to receive your grace. Father, let your spirit speak through our hearts and lives. Let us receive your grace, the love that you bring down to us in this meal, and the love among us and for all the world that we celebrate and share in this meal. Let that take root in our hearts and in our lives. And let our hearts be soft to the voice of your Holy Spirit, guiding us each in the individual parts of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the Lord's Day.
Taste and essence of the sweetest of love Where my heart can come free And my shame is all Your presence, oh. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place and fill it at the Your glory, God, is for our hearts. stand. Mm-hmm. Father, we want to, uh, as we come to the end of our time together, we want to thank you. We just want to close with a moment of gratitude. You have shown us in, in Acts your continued working in the lives of the apostles in the first part of Acts and the lives of Paul and people traveling with him in the second part of Acts, we see that unexplainable things happen, even things that seem really bad. And yet we see that your hand is still working. And as they trusted you through the bad things, you continue to, to guide them. So we ask you to give our hearts trust in you. Give us faith for it. Increase our faith so we can trust you in all things. You've given us the ultimate demonstration of your love in Christ's death on the cross and your power in his resurrection. Help us to trust in your love and your power as we go our way today in Jesus' name.